usually oh, so we usually um, do social media promoting um, outreach stuff, but this time we switched it up a little bit and helped plan this event. So I'm gonna let the other interns introduce themselves if they want to. Um, Hannah, do you wanna quickly introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Hi, I'm Hannah. Um, I'm one of those interns and I'm from originally from Atlanta, Georgia. Um, but yeah, I'm currently up at Tufts with Sophia. Hi, I'm Sylvie. I'm from London, but I'm in Egypt for the year studying abroad. Um, all right, and then, all right, so now um, we're gonna um, talk a little bit about Roots. Um, Sarah, do you want to introduce a little bit about what Roots does, um, organization for those that don't know? Absolutely. So we have some new faces here today. Um, Roots is a grassroots organization located in the West Bank um, near Gush Etzion or Bethlehem. Um, it's an organization which brings together Israelis and Palestinians who live in the West Bank for opportunities for dialogue, peace building, and a chance to kind of get to know each other in a situation that is um, safe for dialogue, safe for conversation, um, and really lets uh, them get to know each other in a way that they might not be able to um, on the ground necessarily. Um, so I love Roots because it um, just gives, it lays, it lays a groundwork for conversation. Um, it doesn't push necessarily political opinion because it recognizes that everybody has a different experience with the conflict with Israel-Palestine at large. Um, and it just wants to offer a space for dialogue and for communication um, as a first step towards building peace. Um, so what we're doing today is showcasing the experiences of student activists and leaders on their campuses in the UK and in the United States who are bringing Israel-Palestine to their campus through dialogue or through education. So I want to get started by allowing our panelists to introduce themselves. Um, and we'd like to get started with, oh, I'm sorry, before we begin, I'm sorry, before we begin, <laughs> begin Rafanan, could you tell us a little bit about the Run for Reconciliation coming up? Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, so just to make sure you all know, another two weeks exactly, on March 14th, Sunday, March 14th, Roots is doing its second run for reconciliation. We have a group of activists, probably going to be about 30 or 40, is a Roots activists who are going to run a nine kilometer course in the Jordan Valley. Why in the Jordan Valley? The Jordan Valley is where we have our second branch of Roots, the first branches between Bethlehem and Hebron. Gush Etzion, what the Israelis call. We now have a Jordan Valley branch. We want to showcase that branch and raise money for it. So this run for conciliation is meant to raise money for the programs in the Jordan Valley. Uh, everyone is invited to look at the crowdfunding site that I'm putting in the chat right now. There you can read more about what we're doing. You can donate to Roots and you can donate to your favorite runner. And Further, I want to say that we're inviting people from around the world to run approximately the same distance with us on Sunday, March 14th, wherever you are, whether it's in Japan or in China, or whether it's in Korea or in California, uh, run with us nine kilometers. If you want to do the shorter course, it's three kilometers. And you can sign up to be one of the runners. Uh, you can send me an email or do it through the, uh, through the links that are on the crowdfunding campaign, whose link I gave you on the screen. Uh, and you'll be able to raise money for Roots through your run, wherever it is around the world, March 14th. That's it. All right, that sounds amazing. Um, so moving on from that, we're going to tell you a little bit about how this event is going to run. We're going to have um, questions that we thought of for the panelists, and we're going to do that for around 45 minutes. Um, and each panelist is gonna be able to answer them. And then at the end, we're gonna have some time for anyone who has any additional questions to ask. If you could put it in the chat, that would be great. Um, you can either privately message me or Sarah or just put it out to everybody. Um, but we're gonna save all of those for the end. Um, and now we're gonna introduce the speakers. I think we're still waiting for one of them to join. Um, but for now, if um, we have Sophia, Yasmin, and Stav, we're still waiting. Oh, she's here. She's here. Okay, sorry. So, and Stav, there are our panelists for today. So, if you guys could all introduce yourselves. Um, Sophia, would you like to begin? 
Sure. Um, I'm Sophia. Um, I'm a junior at Tufts. I'm double majoring in civic studies and Middle Eastern studies. And I, I guess a little bit about my background is I grew up um, in a practicing Jewish family and I attended Jewish day school growing up. So I developed a really strong connection um, to Israel. And when I got to high school, um, I experienced anti-Semitism and anti-Israel activity. And I sort of began to realize that there was more complexity to the situation than I had previously understood and that there were sort of other perspectives to learn about. Um, so when I got to Tufts, I got involved in pro-Israel activism because that was sort of comfortable and safe for me. And I was encouraged by a friend to take this class called Visions of Peace, which was all about examining different perspectives on the conflict um, and sort of challenging each other's opinions and being able to talk about differences um, with other people who didn't necessarily agree with you. So I realized through taking that class that it was just as if not more fulfilling to discuss these topics with people who didn't agree with me, um, but who nonetheless were still committed to learning about and discussing the, the conflict in a challenging but respectful environment. So that sort of led me to become a member of Tufts Students for Two States, which is a coalition of student leaders um, dedicated to supporting the two state solution and putting on joint um, programming between different groups that are involved um, in this discussion on campus. And now, uh, which I'll talk about more later, I'm actually the teacher for the class Visions of Peace that I took that sort of got me involved in all this work to begin with. So that's a little bit about me. And then I can turn it over to Yasmin or Stav. Yeah, hi. <laughs> nice to meet you, Sophia, and everybody. Uh, thank you, Roots, for having us. It's really great to be here. Um, so I'm Yasmin. Um, I'm the co-president of the Edinburgh University Palestinian Israeli Dialogue Society, and for short, we call it UPITS. I am a second year Edinburgh University student studying English literature and history. I am a Jordanian, Lebanese, and Palestinian. So I obviously feel very strongly connected with the region, its issues, culture and its people. I decided to join the society in my first year because I not only wanted to learn more about the conflict but also help create a space where others could also learn more about it. Furthermore, I wanted to help create a space where more people could challenge their own beliefs and learn from each other's perspectives through dialogue. Steph, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, so hi, um, and again, reiterating everything that Yasmin said, it's lovely to meet all of you. Thank you very much for inviting us to speak today. Um, I'm Stav, I'm the other co-president of UPIDS. Um, I'm currently studying international relations and international law, um, and I'm half Israeli and half Norwegian. And I actually grew up all over the place. I did spend kind of half of first year, of oh, first grade, sorry, um, in Israel, and I did my civil service there. Um, but part of my civil service was really in a school for hospitalized children on the border between East and West Jerusalem. And it was really there that I saw the power that actually dialogue can have and was really disappointed in kind of the, the, the way in which adults couldn't uh, see this dialogue often. So I remember one instance where we had, for example, two little kids, you know, uh, one was Palestinian and one was Jewish, and they were just talking to each other, but really in gibberish because they couldn't understand a word the other one was saying. Um, and they were so enthusiastic, right? They were just like really getting into it, like laughing completely, not understanding anything the other person was saying. But at the same time, their parents were just sitting on the opposite edges of the room, right? Just looking at each other, eyeing each other suspiciously. And so I think there really is um, potential for this dialogue where there is space to do it, where the adults don't get in the way. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you all for introducing yourselves. Um, now we would love to hear more about your organization specifically and the work that you're doing on your campuses. So if we can start with UPIDS, either Yasmin or Stav, if you want to um, give an idea of what your organization does. Yeah, sure, I can start. Um, so UPIS was founded in 2018, actually by Stav herself. 
uh, to create an alternative to the polarized discussions that often divide campuses. The aim was and still is to provide a nonpartisan platform for students and staff of the University of Edinburgh to discuss their personal experiences, cultural identities, and political views in relation to Palestine and or Israel. Our committee members are from all year groups and come from all around the world. Our event participants are also incredibly diverse and often range from those who know nothing about the conflict to those who make it their lives work. To ensure that the society remains um, representative and inclusive, although our committee members individually hold various views regarding Palestine or Israel, we are a neutral society. This means that we are not anti or pro-Palestine and or Israel. Um, we are not for or against peace, and we are not affiliated with any organization other than our university. Additionally, we are a nonprofit society, so all our events are free, which is amazing for our event for our participants. We believe that this helps our society to be as open and inclusive as possible to not just our participants, but the speakers we bring in as well. So the background really to creating UPEDS was that we saw, as we all know, how divisive all of these conversations can be on university campuses. And we wanted to create a space where people can simply just engage in discussions with each other, right? Like not even going a step further into education or anything like that, just simply a space where they can hear opinions that they really hadn't been introduced to or been aware of before. And the idea is really to break down echo chambers, to create an alternative to this dichotomy that has been created between you know, pro-Palestinian students and pro-Israeli students, and simply allow, to, uh, allow the creation of more nuanced and respectful conversations um, in order to promote this kind of uh, dialogue and to promote this idea of people hearing uh, alternative views. Yeah, and like we often do this like through our events. So lately we've done webinars and previously seminars. We've done panels, exclusive screenings, roundtable discussions, interviews, academic paper discussions. And in those events, we have brought speakers like Abu Dabush, Basel Osama, and Mira Awad and discuss topics like the deal of the century, the gender preoccupations, the gender perceptions of occupation, women in law, the humanitarian crisis in Gaza youth campaigns and even medicine. So the popularity and uniqueness of our event earned us the Edinburgh University Student Association Outstanding Society Award in 2020 and has like encouraged us to host um, more um, perhaps like taboo speakers like by the way Mangistu who talked about her personal and political experiences as a bisexual Israeli Ethiopian woman We've also collaborated with other societies in our university, like the Linguistic Society, to talk about like cultural inclusion. And yeah, in the new, near future, we're hoping to host a paper discussion about like developments in the West Bank and have more webinars on nationalism and academics. So in addition to all of the events that we've been running, we've also started creating an international network of similar societies. And originally this started as a very organic kind of, um, you know, venture because students from, you know, uh, just universities across the UK started reaching out to us and asking us, you know, how did you get started with this? Can we do something similar? You know, and really just asked for our advice. And what ended up happening was that now we have um, a range of kind of societies on a range of campuses, both across the UK, but now also in Canada and a few in the US as well, that are really following um, this idea. And we're launching our very first uh, international conference later this semester as well. And you're all very welcome to come and join us. And again, if you know anyone, or if you yourself would like to start a similar society, we're, we're here, we're open, and we'll love to kind of help you out with that as well. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing. It's wonderful to hear, especially the work that's coming up for you guys in the coming months. That's really exciting. Um, so Sophia, if you could tell us a little bit about the program that you're with. Yeah, so I'm kind of involved in two different programs at Tufts. One is, as I mentioned, the Tufts Students for Two States Coalition. Um, that organization was founded, I think, in 2016. Um, and it was basically designed to sort of break down tensions between various groups involved in the Israel-Palestine discussion on campus. So it's kind of a place to bring campus leaders together um, 
who are on like executive boards or leadership groups for different clubs. And it's a space where we can come together as leaders and sort of talk about um, our club work, sort of what obstacles we see to engaging in dialogue with other clubs. Um, we try and kind of come up with some shared values um, such as believing in a two-state solution and then sort of channel those shared values into planning events together so that we can sort of come together and do meaningful work together despite sort of the boundaries that exist between these different groups. Um, and so that's TS for TS. And then the bigger thing that I'm a part of is Tufts Visions of Peace. Um, it was originally designed as a course that students would take um, to learn about um, a multiplicity of Israeli, Palestinian, and diasporic narratives surrounding the conflict with a particular focus on peace building and grassroots um, organizing in Israel, Palestine. And originally it was paired with a trip over the summer. So the class would go to the region um, and get to sort of meet these organizations that they'd been studying and meet the people on the ground. Now it's not, obviously we don't have the option for a trip because of COVID, but also because of funding. So right now the focus is the, the course. Um, and it's a student-led, student-taught course through Tufts Experimental College. And it's basically a space for both students who already have connections to the conflict, relationships to the conflict, um, opinions about the conflict, as well as people who have no prior experience with the conflict to sort of come into the same room and one, learn together about the, num the different contrasting narratives that exist within the conflict, um, as well as to have a space to engage in nuanced dialogue with one another um, and sort of challenge our own personal ideas about the conflict that we might've come into the class with, really be able to learn from other people who have different life experiences than us, um, both in the classroom and through our diverse um, guest speaker lineup. Um, and yeah, it's a really amazing opportunity, I think because at Tufts, it is a pretty hostile environment with regards to the conflict, which I think we'll get into a bit later, but it's really amazing to have a space for students who are genuinely interested in having these discussions in a safe and respectful environment, um, but at the same time having a space to have their beliefs challenged, um, to sort of delve more into the foundational disagreements um, that exist about the origin of the conflict, to learn about the just vast um, network of organizations and individuals and speakers who are engaging in peace building efforts. Um, and yeah, ultimately to just hear all of the different narratives and histories that exist with regards to the conflict. Um, so that's, yeah, a little bit about visions of peace. Great to hear. Thanks so much for sharing. Um, before we move on to the next question, I just want to clarify that Sophia's work at Tufts and Yasmin and Stav's work with UPIDs, they're separate um, things that they do. They're not together. They're not joint. Um, I just want to clarify that if that was confusing for anybody. Um, and so moving on to our next question is just what are the attitudes on your campuses in general? in terms of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, this topic in general, anything surrounding this topic, how do students see it? What's the vibe there? What's the emotion towards it? Um, Sophia, if you wanna start, that'd be great. Yeah, sure. Um, so there's definitely a lot of tension on Tufts campus with regards to the conflict. The, the way that I see it is there's, I think a small but very loud group of us, I would say myself included, of people who are really passionate about the conflict and are very vocal about, yeah, our opinions on the conflict. But I think the majority of the school is actually pretty unaware of the conflict. But because 
it's such a talked about topic on Tufts campus. Everybody sort of finds a way to, you know, be involved or know a club that's partnered with another club to do this thing related to Israel-Palestine. So I think even though it's sort of the interest and noise comes from like a smaller group of people on campus, I would still say that it's a very much, probably one of the most talked about issues at Tufts. Um, and the thing that that I struggle with about being at this at Tufts and the environment surrounding the conflict is that it's very much a binary where you're either pro-Israel or you're pro-Palestine and the binary is very much expected and upheld in the conversations that are had on campus. So there's a lot of animosity um, and hostility between different groups and individuals on campus because of this, you have to be, you have to fit into either one side or the other. And I think that's really harmful because it really perpetuates this us versus them mentality. And there's this constant kind of othering of people on campus that don't fit into one of these, you know, binary categories. Um, so I think that was sort of what led me to get involved in the work that I'm involved in is like seeking somewhere where I didn't have to exist either on one side or the other. Um, like seeking a community where this middle ground, the gray area is, you know, prioritized and it's not about fitting into this binary us versus them, pro this or pro that. Um, but that's definitely the energy on campus. Yeah, I would say it's some people, a few people are very passionate, very involved. A lot of people don't really know a lot, but are sort of drawn into it because of the way that it's so prevalent and so frequently discussed at Tufts by the few people that are really passionate about it. Um, and then sort of, yeah, this just upholding of a very clear binary where you can either belong to the pro-Israel side or the pro-Palestinian side, but there's not so much room in the middle. I think that's really interesting to hear, Sophia, and I think that we do have some similar experiences on Edinburgh as well, just in terms of kind of the polarization of the discussion and the idea of UPIDs really came from that. Um, and I think in many ways we were lucky, uh, so to speak, because just before we got started, um, there was some kind of clash really between the Palestinian society and the Israeli society, and both of them had to get shut down due to protests. And so um, actually we were entering into a sort of vacuum that was uh, created, and that really allowed us to get our footing and get started. But now something that we do try to emphasize at UPIDS is really not to somehow become a new echo chamber in and of ourselves, because sometimes it's very tempting to allow this gray zone to become a kind of pro-peace um, little bubble where we don't really get to hear other perspectives, which is why we really emphasize the fact that we are just a platform for people to speak. And so we are able to get people coming in from the newly established Palestinian society and also from the um, newly established Israeli society. So they can all kind of discuss things with each other. And so it's a very unique space where we can have both, you know, BDS activists on the one hand and people that believe, you know, in the occupation of the West Bank on the other hand and have them both in the same room and kind of talking to each other uh, just because UPIDS itself doesn't really have an agenda beyond just creating this space. That's really cool to hear. Um, it sounds as though you're both looking to create similar spaces. Um, I would love to hear more um, from Yasmin and Stav. Um, you've stressed that the space that you've created is solely for dialogue. There's no kind of push to make it more than any more than that. Can you talk about, um, I know you've touched on it, but can you talk about what you feel the role and the value and the impact is of dialogue specifically and how it can engage people in a, a unique way um, and provide that kind of opportunity for progress forward? Yeah, so it's not meant to be, you know, it's not supposed to have an agenda or anything like that. It's just supposed to be a space where people can talk, have that dialogue. And I think like staff touched on this as well to avoid this kind of echo chamber that we often pit ourselves with. I mean, like just speaking like from personal experience, like as a Palestinian, I didn't speak to any Israeli before I came to the university and staff was like literally the first Israeli that I've ever met. 
and I saw her in a stall and we just started to get talking and we found this common ground. I mean, sure, we had like differences and disagreements, but at the end of the day, you know, just through dialogue, we were able to find something that we both agreed on and we realized that we had a lot of similarities as well. I feel like through this society, people, you know, they, they engage in this dialogue and they realize, oh, you know, I actually believe in my beliefs more now that I understand what the other side is arguing. Or actually, hmm, you know, I, I don't really agree with what I used to agree with because I heard the other side. And, you know, that person or those people had, you know, like valid points. So I think that that's what we're trying to get at here. You know, you go to, a, to our events and you realize, oh, you know, like I actually learned so much in this event just by hearing the other side. And I think that's what dialogue is all about. Okay. Um, do you want to add on that? Do you have anything to add? That was perfect. <laughs> um, so likewise, um, Sophia, we'd love to hear um, what you feel that the role of um, education specifically is um, in engaging people abroad. And I know that you have um, discussed that dialogue is an element of um, the education that you provide. Um, can you talk about how those interact and um, what that looks like? Yeah, so I guess the way that we teach our course is definitely about, it's we try to make it less of like a traditional educational model where we're like at the front of the classroom lecturing about these events and more of a just a conversation with our students where we balance us giving lectures we do a lot of like small group work where we'll have we'll allow the groups themselves to sort of delve into different topics and sort of report back and then we'll all talk about it as a class so the way that we combine education and dialogue is sort of because we want to give the students themselves agency in formulating their own opinions. And we like, we don't really want to teach them much besides the history because we want them to be able to figure out where they fit into this whole discussion on their own. So kind of, the role that I see education in this conflict, I think it's needed education about the conflict to sort of counteract the constant bombardment of like media and headlines that are often really biased about the conflict on both sides. And I think because a lot of people learn about the conflict from the media and from news, I think it's hard to have the necessary historical context as well as like an objective, yeah, objective opinion on these topics because we're all about in our class um, sharing as many different narratives and viewpoints as possible. So I think the need for education on this topic is so great because I think people are often introduced to it in a way where they're taking a side without even having the slightest bit of educational historical context for that. So that's sort of the purpose um, that I see of education is sort of, yeah, counteracting this bombardment of biased media coverage and giving people the tools, not the answers, but like the tools through different perspectives, different um, narratives, history, all that stuff, like giving them the tools to formulate their own opinions. Um, and so I think besides the historical piece of the education is also making sure that we are teaching our students how to have difficult conversations, because I think something that I learned at Tufts is there are certain things that are very um, productive when engaging in discussions with people that you don't agree with. And there are certain things that can really hinder a productive conversation about these conflicts. So on top of having this historical educational component, we're also incorporating how to have productive conversations with people you disagree with 
um, into our curriculum. So that can look like icebreakers, sort of just helping break down barriers between our students, letting them get to know each other, work together on projects together, um, and all of these kind of things to help them see one another like as people, as partners, as peers, and not as like the other side. Um, and then I guess one of our last goals in teaching is like reminding our students that there's always more to learn with regards to this conflict. And we're always kind of reminding them like, we're not the experts, we're students like, yes, we've started this learning process a little like before you, but we're still on this journey and we're still always learning and questioning and so sort of supporting our students in knowing that they're not gonna finish this class and like have all of the answers. In fact, they'll probably finish the class and have like more questions and more uncertainties than they've had before. Um, but we think that's a really valuable part of the educational experience. Um, and so, yeah, overall, I think we see education as really important because it's such a charged, controversial, polarizing topic on our campus. We wanna give people um, the historical context that they need to understand the conflict from points of view of all relevant key players in the conflict, um, learning, helping them learn how to engage in challenging conversations in productive ways, um, and then guiding them and supporting them in formulating their own opinions on the conflict. Um, so yeah, I guess, that was a lot, but ultimately we we don't wanna see ourselves so much as teachers, more so that we're providing the resources, the narratives, the speakers to help them understand the realities on the ground from people on the ground as much as possible. Um, and then supporting them in sort of grappling with and challenging their own ideas about um, this conflict in a safe, respectful, but also intentionally challenging environment. All right, thanks so much for sharing that. That sounds really interesting, really useful. Um, so moving on from that, you all have said very um, great things about the efforts that your, your societies, your groups are doing in bringing people together, helping understand each other. Um, so I wanna ask the bigger question of like why, why, how is these sort of things abroad, these sort of engagement efforts abroad, how are they gonna help out with the peacemaking process as a whole? Why do we need to, to do them at all? What's the point, I guess? Um, so Stav and Yasmin, if you guys wanna start. I think Yasmin and I have maybe slightly different views about this. And I think everyone on the committee does have a slightly different view about this issue as well. Um, personally, I see our role as very different from kind of a larger peace building initiative. I mean, I have been involved with those kind of initiatives in Israel in the past, and I think they're very important, but I feel like as people abroad, uh, that's less of our role and kind of external involvement isn't really what we're trying to push here. Um, I think that really what we do bring to the table with this dialogue, and it's really sad to say it, but just the fact that, you know, people aren't screaming at each other across picket lines, in my opinion, is already an achievement on kind of a campus. And the fact that we are able to have more nuanced conversation and hear more perspectives, I feel like that really enriches student experiences in general, and that's really why I do it. I think Sophia said something really important, and that's like the importance of like education, especially in an age where we have like all of this fake news and rhetoric and people who get um, involved in the conflict take, usually take a side. Um, like for me, I was born as a Palestinian. This is like the side that I was born with. And you know, this is the side that I initially took um, and still take. But you know, like I feel like educating people about the conflict and telling them, not telling them, like showing them that there are two sides to it um, is really important. And, I wouldn't say that we're a peace organization at all, but maybe people who are in our society will be more interested in the conflict after that and take part in initiatives like that or in educational roles. So I guess you can you can put it in that way. But yeah, I think it's it's more of an educational purpose. That that's what we're here for. 
Um, um, oh, sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I was just going to ask an additional question, which you can, of course, fold into your answer. I was going to ask. Um, I I don't know the, of course, the the makeup of your of your um, individual societies and who's involved. But do you find that you have a lot of students who are engaged who don't necessarily have a personal connection to the conflict or um, what you would describe as a personal connection? And do you find that you have um, kind of how do people who aren't necessarily personally involved um, find their role in dialogue or in education? Um, so, of course, answer the original question, but if you have a moment, we'd love to hear that as well. I mean, I think that, you know, that that is a role, I think, in itself, the fact that somebody who doesn't know about the conflict at all comes to our society, suddenly wants to know more, more about it and, you know, engage in it in some way. I think that is in itself a valuable part to play. And it's one of the things that we do reach out for and we do promote um, in our society. I, I think um, perhaps Stav already mentioned this, but you know we have like two co-presidents, like one is representative of Palestine, one is, uh, is a representative of Israel. Um, and in this way, I think we were able to get like two perspectives on it. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean that those two people have to be Palestinian or, is, or Israeli. They can be any nationality. And I think that also opens up, you know, discussion and allows people to not take sides, but kind of engage in different points of view in that way. And just before, you know, we give Mike back to Sophia, we do have like a very wide range of people involved in the society as well. And just on committee, I mean, we've had like nine different nationalities on board. We've had people from all sorts of religion. Like we've had, um, I mean, a Buddhist member of committee. We've had, you know, Jewish, Christian and Islam, like like, like Muslim people of all Islamic denominations, basically. Um, and just really a very wide range of people from different backgrounds and with different research interests as well. I mean, from a first year to a PhD student. So it is really nice to kind of be able to reach different parts of the university as well because it is quite big and it's nice to kind of um, yeah to talk to people of different perspectives. Sorry Sophia. No worries, no worries. Um, well I guess I can start with that question then go back to the original one just to continue on this topic of sort of the makeup of our groups but so something I've always found really interesting and also I think really positive is that the class um at least when I was a student and then now that I'm the teacher it tends to be mostly like I would say at least half like of Jewish students then some people that are that have sort of pro-Palestinian we don't have any Palestinian students but people who have pro-Palestinian viewpoints and then some who sort of are just coming in to learn. Um, but I think the fact that this topic is so complex, complex and nuanced actually sort of evens the playing field in a way because everybody who takes our class, like we're very intentional about how we sell the class and sort of, yeah, how we market it. So everybody is there to learn and to question. So even if you come in already having a connection to the conflict or you don't, I think that the fact that this is so complicated and so nuanced, yeah, sort of lev levels the playing field because everybody is starting from where they're starting from, but everybody is learning and questioning together, even if it's from a different point of like, relationship to the conflict. So everyone takes away what they need to, I think, from the course, like even the, you know, students who already have like a really rich historical understanding, maybe from like a Jewish day school or from another class they took, like even those students are just as eager to learn and to question and to grow as are the kids who don't know anything about the conflict. So I think um, I think it's really great to, like, even when there's a lot of Jewish students in the room or, you know, certain people with similar backgrounds or experiences, I think that doesn't really take away from the success of the course at all because, every, again, yeah, everybody is sort of starting from 
their experience and their background, but then being willing to sort of suspend that and really challenge themselves to learn more from other people, learn more about their own opinions. Um, yeah, so I think like the makeup changes every year, you know, the makeup of the class, but I've found that even, you know, no matter the breakdown of who's in the room, like everybody has somewhat, something to learn from everyone else in the room. Um, so that's really great. And then why is, yeah, the original question, I guess, why do I feel like, like this work is worth doing? Abroad, especially abroad. Um, I think whether or not we like it, like Israel-Palestine has been an incredibly relevant foreign policy issue in America for years. Um, and I think it's going to continue to be so as long as the conflict um, continues. So I think from and aspire, like as someone who wants to go into politics from that point of view, I think that it's crucial that our generation is sort of getting educated on the conflict and sort of understanding the nuances and the different perspectives and narratives involved in the conflict. So that when we're the ones that are, you know, in Congress, like working on these laws, these legislations and bills and foreign policy and all that, like we have the background and the context and the understanding um, of the nuance sort of needed to address this as like a foreign policy issue that is a very, you know, controversial one and one that's been attempted, like an, a conflict that has been talked about and tried to be fixed for years. So I think like from that point of view, that's sort of where I see the importance of the abroad piece, because even if we think, oh, like America shouldn't have, you know, this big of a role or impact on the conflict, like whether or not we think that the reality, at least right now, is that it is an issue of really big importance to Americans and American politicians. So I think it's really important to sort of encourage our generation to approach the conflict in, yeah, a more nuanced way, in a way that incorporates all of the different narratives and histories that exist within the conflict. Um, and that way, even if we're small groups on our campuses, like hopefully we can, our students and our group members can sort of pass this on to their peers and we can sort of start small, but a hope to sort of change the national dialogue surrounding the conflict. And maybe, yeah, when we're in politics and our generation is working to sort of solve all of these problems, we might be able to have a different approach that's sort of grounded in a more holistic, a more binational understanding of this conflict. So I guess that's sort of where my, yeah, inspiration comes from. All right, um, thanks so much for sharing. Thank you, Sophia, Sadia, Yasmin. Um, before we move on to the Q&A section, um, I wanna introduce another student activist on, on a different campus. His name is Rory um, and he's from uh, Card Cardiff University in Wales. So Rory, if you could introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about what you do um, and then any reflection, comments um, from the speakers and the panel. Sure, uh, it's very nice uh, to be here. Uh, I'm actually familiar with Roots because I was a campus leader for a trip, a dialogue trip to Israel and Palestine, uh, led by the Union of Jewish Students for students of all faiths and backgrounds. And we saw Roots, we actually went to where Roots are based and, and heard uh, two of their speakers. And actually uh, a lot of the participants say that that was the highlight of that day, um, of the trip actually in general. Uh, so I started the Cardiff University Israel-Palestine, well, initially it was going to be called the Dialogue Society, but we were told um, that 
discussion is a better word to use and even the word dialogue can be contentious for some because of the idea of kind of the power dynamic so a lot of learnings about linguistics there um, so generally Cardiff University is quite a chilled campus when it comes to politics and, and these sorts of things um, which I'm kind of glad about in a way um, because it makes it less toxic um, but we kind of had the the kind of threat of things going bad when when there was a BDS motion at our student union where it just became very divisive. Um, most people abstained during that vote. Um, however, the majority kind of voted against it, so it didn't pass. It was very close. Um, generally, that's something that's passing a lot in the UK universities. But what I learned from that what was going on was at AGM and they were asking me what's going on so it made me realize that essentially we're in an information war and i think definitely on instagram and social media i see that now that it's it's a fight of kind of who who we're going to reach first in terms of you know the israeli perspective or the palestinian perspective so what i wanted to create was this kind of neutral environment that very similar to the others was an educational platform you know we were not activism not really advocacy we weren't calling for a solution i just wanted to make sure that the people in this information war were being provided with at least multiple perspectives why i say multiple is that i don't think there's a there's not really both perspectives because within Israeli society and Palestinian society, you have many different kind of perspectives depending on kind of your own identities. Um, so yeah, that same summer before setting up the society, uh, I led the dialogue trip and it was just amazing to see that dialogue could happen, especially given that some universities like UCL and KCL, um, there's often been very violent scenes uh, kind of sometimes like Hen Mazig, when he spoke at university, people stormed in. So I wanted to change the dynamic and, and make sure that Cardiff never became like that. Um, so kind of two main um, observations I had. First was um, the barriers for getting students involved. So for Jewish students, there was often kind of a hesitancy coming to our events because of feeling like they'll be coming into an environment where they'll be attacked because they, they've faced that a lot already. And generally, the UK Jewish population is only, I think, 300,000. So it's quite small. And I would argue that it's probably outnumbered by those who are probably anti-Israel. So there's often that feeling from them of kind of, especially given that 70% of Jewish students go in the UK go to Jewish only schools, there hasn't really been that interaction as much in kind of these uh environments and it, and it scares them a lot of jewish students were, were scared to come in because they feel they'd just be attacked um some of the israeli students also said that you know i've dealt enough with that over in israel i don't want to have to deal with it here when it came to the palestinian students um the the barrier for participation was often the idea that what's this actually going to do what's the point is this going to change the occupation is this going to change the human rights situation in gaza what's dialogue going to do so what i learned from that was really that whenever you have these dialogue spaces you really have to emphasize what is the end goal is this just a talk and you know is this just an olive branch or um there's a lot of new um, terms for this but essentially yeah so we, we learned that we really had to ensure that this was a fully safe space for both people uh we had to have the red lines which which was very difficult when it came to when something would become anti-semitic or, or racist against palestinians um and i think generally the biggest other barrier was were two other things in terms of making the society happen one was a lack of funding for this middle ground. So if we were an Israel society or just a Palestinian society, we would very easily have gotten all the money and the sponsors from those various organizations because they're, you know, they're very much up and running and established. However, this middle ground of kind of combining both, not much, there are a couple of organizations and charities in the UK, but it's tough. So we couldn't really get speakers or funding very easily. Um, and then secondly, anti-normalization. I would say that that is the biggest barrier in the UK for making something like this happen. Um, for example, there was a Palestinian organization that I tried to get to come and you know, provide speakers and get involved. And you know, they said that, okay, we will do it as long as you know, this... Well, initially the guy said, yeah, I'm very happy to do this, but then he spoke to his team and 
um, he said, well, we could only do this if you unapologetically stand for the inalienable rights of the Palestinians. And I asked, you know, a couple of times, okay, can you clarify what does that mean? And he wouldn't clarify it. And that that that's the tough thing is is kind of like where is this line drawn? Um, you know, is it is he saying that I need to say that the right of return is eligible or stuff like that? Um, I think anti normalization was the issue, and and also just fear fear from backlash of their own communities. So an example of this was that at Bristol Uni there was another dialogue society like mine. And they held an event and, and the Palestinian um, speaker, unfortunately, had um, uh, someone called her and kind of verbally abused her for, for getting involved in this and, and doing normalization. And then on the flip side, the, the Jewish president had abuse from her own community because she wrote an article about her society and talked about swallowing difficult truths about Israel. And there, there's a movement in the UK called Cherut, um, it's inspired by Jab Jabotinskyism, and I'm sure um, the staff here is very familiar with them being on the opposite side with Yahad. And um, yeah, they, they sent her kind of abusive messages and told her you should be ashamed of yourself. So I think for me, I was quite privileged that I'm neither Jewish nor Palestinian. And so I didn't kind of have that fear of backlash from my own respective communities for normalization. Um, and I feel like people maybe trusted me more that it would be nonpartisan, but yeah, ultimately, um, to summarize the whole experience, um, there were some moments of progress, definitely. You know, for example, um, we held a Christmas Hanukkah event to celebrate what, you know, to celebrate the cultural element. You know, it doesn't have to be about politics all the time. We wanted to do an event where we can see the connection both peoples have to the land and celebrate that. And we had, you know, an Egyptian guy walking in by chance and just joined. And, you know, by the end of the night, he was playing Drazel with the Jews and, and he probably had his first ever interaction with an Israeli and learned about Hanukkah. And I think he said he, he, he never knew that it actually originated from the land. Um, the other moment of progress was we our, our last event was about the future of Palestinian leadership with someone from Zimam speaking. And like something that I never thought would be possible, but in Zoom, I had all these people from Zionist activists to members of the Palestinian Solidarity Campaign who are, who are very hardcore. Um, all these like Israelis, Palestinians in the same room. And I thought, when else is that gonna happen? And that's exactly what I wanted to happen through this society. And even though it's not everything, it's not changing everything, at least it's something. And I hope I helped people think in a different way. Uh, but unfortunately, I, I think the whole experience was, and, and it'd be interesting to hear from the other speakers about this, as well as everything else I touched on, is that it was mentally exhausting. Um, it, it really, I, I couldn't continue with it. I, I really wish I could have continued with it into this year, made it an online platform, and, and maybe I will now. This is quite therapeutic, but all of the kind of rejections, all of the barriers with anti-normalization and with funding and the kind of fear of, of upsetting friends because I have many Jewish friends and many pro-Palestinian friends and I don't want to fall out with them over this. It, it, it was very draining and I just felt I couldn't really continue. And, and these, uh, it's a very difficult environment to be in to kind of hear these, have difficult conversations and um, sometimes escalation. And, and so unfortunately um, the society kind of as it is, isn't continuing because um, COVID actually hit us very badly once we got running, because we started in September 2019. Uh, it was a struggle to take it online, but who knows, maybe um, we will begin again and uh, maybe in partnership with the other people like here. So my takeaways to you is definitely, um, you know, you may not achieve everything, but at least achieving something is better than nothing. And uh, rather than accepting these issues of lack of funding and anti-normalization, at least actively start doing something about it and really build this, this middle ground to become something bigger, really build allyships, but fully understand the fears and the barriers that both Jews and Palestinians and Israelis as well will have about this and understand why and, and very much address those, address those why they think this dialogue is pointless and does nothing and make sure dialogue does become something. So thank you. Thank you, Rory. It's good to hear from you. Um, so we're going to jump into our Q&A now. Um, if you have any questions, feel free, to, feel free to put them in the chat, but I'm going to turn to Rachel first for our very first question. Rachel.
<laughs> I'm sorry. It was just answered. Maybe you could. Oh, oh, that. okay, absolutely. So Sylvie has a similar question, which um, I would love to have answered. Um, let's begin with Yasmin and Stav. Um, how would you counter the belief that dialogue is normalization and therefore deeply problematic for some people? Is this an issue that comes up in your society and how do you counter it? I think this is definitely an issue that comes up and sorry, just pause, but very nice to see you, Rory. Um, but <laughs> it's definitely an issue that um, does come up. Um, when we're inviting speakers, especially, and we've had very similar experiences to what Rory has been describing as well. Um, and I think that the main thing that we do uh, do, first of all, is just the fact that we are nonpartisan. And we say that, you know, we do not try to promote dialogue as an end in and of itself in a similar way to kind of pro-peace organizations, and that usually helps. And also just emphasizing the fact that we are providing a platform that really has no strings attached, um, that isn't funded by any external organization. So nothing that could be linked to Israel, for example, it's only really grassroots funded and even people that come to events don't have to pay anything so that people, you know, that might be pro like anti-normalization and would like to participate, but might feel uncomfortable because their participation would be funding dialogue will feel more at ease because, you know, no one has to actually pay to take part. Um, so we just try to kind of emphasize all of these points in order to make them feel more comfortable. Uh, Yasmin? Yeah, no, definitely, like 100% what Stav said. Also, we took time to like linguistically think about how we promote our society. So we make sure that to say like, and or Palestine or Israel. So like either you, some people believe that, you know, it's Palestine and Israel, two separate things. Some people don't even acknowledge Israel or don't even acknowledge Palestine. So, you know, we take consideration in all kinds of views. So everybody is welcome. Um, I guess, yeah, on a similar note, like we also don't try to say that dialogue is, yeah, sort of the solution. I think we sort of are very transparent with our students about like why we are led to do this work. And a lot of it is more to do with like the environment on campus than anything and sort of the experiences we've had like struggling to not even engage in dialogue necessarily but just to even talk about the conflict like in a way that you know isn't people screaming at each other so I think one thing yeah is just that we're honest with our students about why the course was created and we're also very um yeah honest with them too about again that we're not trying to um promote necessarily dialogue as the answer but it's kind of like in our experiences on campus like it has been a success um to a certain degree even just as like students who want to engage with each other. So I think we, we try to, yeah, be transparent and honest about the goals of our course, but also we make space in our class for any and all discussions that people wanna have. So like, even if someone wanted to bring up the topic of normalization, which hasn't come up yet, like that would be something that we would welcome, I think, in our class um, as something to discuss, but it hasn't come up yet. Um, but we are aware of, and sometimes our speakers touch on this, the problems of dialogue um, and the way that it kind of evens, that the way that dialogue can sort of even the playing field in a way that is not reflective of the power imbalances that exist. Um, so I don't really have a good answer because I think because we want to make space for like all people's beliefs, we definitely acknowledge that idea that dialogue is normalization for some people. And so we, again, just sort of try to be honest with our students and ask them 
to be honest with us and it's okay for our students to have different beliefs. Like we're not trying to come to any sort of consensus in any way. Um, and we want to like make space and appreciate the fact that students might not agree with even, you know, the class or the way the class is taught, but we sort of try to just hold all of these different realities in the same room without needing to counter them or resolve them, if that makes any sense. <laughs> Oh, all right, great. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, um, so our, our next question, someone asked this earlier, is have you created a meaningful dialogue with hardline pro-Palestine and pro-Israel activists on your campus? And has this led to a common agenda on promoting grassroots peace building programs among Palestinian and Israeli university counterparts? So this is from Yehonatan Tomer in Jerusalem. This question seems like it has two parts. So um, it's mean and stop if you guys want to try to tackle that that'd be great yeah thank you Jonathan for the question um I think that as for the part with about engaging with various perspectives I think we've definitely 100 percent on that and that also ties in to the issue of normalization really before we got started we really made sure to consult kind of more extreme views on either side to make sure that this would be a platform that they would be comfortable coming to um, and so throughout also we have been having speakers and participants from, you know, all sides of the political spectrum, as we mentioned, there are more than two kind of perspectives um, in this conflict. I think with regards to kind of more grassroots initiative in Israel, Palestine, we really haven't as a society gotten involved with that. Um, we have had speakers coming um, from, you know, Palestinian and Israeli universities. We have had, you know, people um, volunteering to mark papers for our upcoming international seminar um, from Palestinian and Israeli universities, but we haven't really kind of started any initiative on the ground uh, there. Did I miss something, Yasmin? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think you said everything I had to say. Um, I would say like on the vision side, we've definitely, um, I think struggled with bringing in more, yeah, hardline activists. I guess a lot of the people who are drawn to our course um, tend to be not necessarily in the middle because we definitely have like more conservative students or more liberal students, but we definitely tend to attract people that want to engage with the other side. So we, ha we haven't had so much success bringing in, for example, like leaders of some of the bigger organizations on campus that are involved in this work. Um, but I think even despite that, I think we have still made a lot of progress um, on our campus just in terms of like even giving students um, a chance to step out of like these more hardline spaces because the clubs tend to be like very charged. Um, and so I think sort of just thinking about what success looks like to our groups and for us, like even though we haven't necessarily reached specific audiences that we might want to reach, say, yeah, the more hardline pro either side activists, I think still it's a success with the students that we have managed to bring in and the organizations that we've been able to introduce them to and allow them to speak to. Um, and then also just like through my back to the two, Tough Students for Two States Coalition, like the fact that clubs that historically at Tufts like were very much not working together and not partnering together, the fact that we've been able to come together and start working on a common agenda for programs on our campus, um, that has been very successful. And we have, even though we disagree on a number of things, we can still come together on certain values or certain ideas that we both prioritize and 
can sort of promote those types of programs on our campus. So I think, yeah, even though we haven't reached everybody, we've reached a lot of people and we have made a lot of progress on our campus in terms of programming, um, partnering with different or grassroots organizations, um, and honestly, being hardline in our class is kind of not the norm, I would say. And so it's really nice, even for if there's, you know, one or two more opinionated students, like they sort of feed off of the energy of the other students who are very much, um, yeah, trying to create the same kind of environment that we want, which is one where people, even if no matter how opinionated you are, like we can all sort of think about these topics and discuss them together. So now that wasn't a super direct answer, but I think we have made a lot of um, progress on our campus. <laughs> That's good to hear. Thank you all for your contributions. Um, so our next question is about um, the practice of dialogue. So this is particularly for, um, for Stav and Yasmin, but um, Sophia, if you'd like to weigh in, feel free. Um, uh, what is it like to talk about topics which can be really upsetting um, or traumatic for students, um, perhaps the Holocaust or the Nakba or things that can really bring out emotion or um, tough experiences for, for people who are engaging in dialogue. Do you avoid those? Do you bring them up? Do you bring them up in certain spaces? Can you tell us a little bit about what that conversation looks like? Yeah, so that's an interesting question. I think we the these kind of conversations usually come up in like discussion circles where there's like a very open space. And I think that was maybe easier before COVID because it was in person and you could kind of gauge the reaction that people had towards like certain issues. Um, but I think like we wouldn't bring it up like right away at the beginning of the discussion and kind of surprise everybody with that. But, you know, like through the, throughout the discussion, maybe we bring it up in the middle towards the end. And I think that has been pretty emotional in the past from at least from my experiences with the society. Um, and I think when we see it becoming too emotional or, for example, somebody getting very angry or, you know, like to the point where, you know, it's probably unacceptable in terms of like respectful um, spaces and safe spaces, then Stav and I would kind of interfere and, and steer the conversation somewhere else and try to, you know, bring down the emotions of the room a bit. I think often also the more kind of emotional uh, discussions, at least for me personal, have been the most kind of meaningful ones. Mm -hmm. um, we've had, for example, song sharing circles where, you know, I was on the verge of tears. I think many people in the room were on the verge of tears, just sharing more personal experiences, sharing personal reactions to art or to discussions that we've had before. So I think that the emotion is a very strong and important part of the discussion as well. Um, as long as it doesn't really harm the other students, as Yasmin mentioned, once it is kind of personal and we are able to reach this place of sharing and openness, I think that is one of the more beautiful things actually that we're able to do. Mm -hmm, definitely. I feel also links back to the previous question about like getting more like hardline people into the society or whatever, like that is a perspective in itself. And I feel like maybe this is like perhaps one of the downsides of a dialogue society because people who come to our events usually are open to have dialogue and those people are not usually hardline people but we have gotten some people like for example from justice for palestine society or people who are very like zionist pro-zionist so to come to our events and i think they have been quite meaningful in you know seeing that perspective and then seeing like the opposite perspective in the same room and i think that's definitely added for like meaningful discussions and I think, again, with those extreme views, then something like this kind of more personal angle does really help to bring in people. Also, if this is like if there's anyone here that might want to start something like this. And um, I think that personal friendships or personal relationships of trust with people can really bring them in and really make them feel like they're comfortable to come to these spaces, even though politically they might think they disagree with them before actually taking part. Mm -hmm. we, we really encourage like people to bring up personal experiences if they do have them because in that way you can't really argue that you know their opinion is invalid because it's something that they've experienced themselves and even if they they stand in opposite sides of the spectrum at least in that way they can find some sort of common ground and dialogue in that way 
All right, I just wanna make sure we get to some more questions um, in the time that we have. So I'm gonna ask the next one now. Um, this is from Kayla Evenchik. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your last name right. Um, but she said, I work for a progressive Zionist youth movement whose membership includes Zionist and anti-Zionist. During COVID, we've experienced a significant increase in divisive exchanges over online platforms. Is this something that you have experienced and do you have recommendations how to create and uphold guidelines for respectful, respectful dialogue on online platforms? So um, Sophia, if you wanna start um, or, or uh, stop and me if you wanna go after that. Yeah, so our class, we're actually really lucky that uh, because of Tufts like testing regimen, our class is in person. Um, so we sort of don't have necessarily challenges over online platforms because we're all together in person every week. But I guess something that has been important um, just like for our dialogue in the classroom, which I suppose could be sort of transferred to an online platform is like the importance of establishing like community norms at the beginning of any discussion. I know like from, you know, years of going to camp and like school, they community norms, sometimes people are not the biggest fan of, but I think it's actually effective, especially in a group with people that like you might not agree with or you might not know well just to sort of establish like what are the ground rules for this event like what just like establishing some guidelines for how to interact with other people um I think has been very helpful in our class and could be helpful online um and also like again I don't know because we don't do a lot of online stuff but like sort of having someone moderating the comments, like maybe having questions like sent in ahead of time so that they can be reviewed um, or just having, yeah, just making sure that like the, in, the comments that are coming in are being moderated. Um, like I know on Zoom, we've had some issues with that at Tufts and they've just like ended up turning off the pow like the chatting option. But yeah, so basically we don't have much recommendations for online platforms, but I guess that yeah, community norms would be a contribution from in-person work that could potentially be helpful online. Yeah, I think it's very similar for us. I mean, I think there are the kind of more technical elements of preventing Zoom bombing from happening, if you know what that is, where people actually try to target specific events and that, you know, is done through registration, through, as Sophia said, disenabling the chat, making sure people can only chat with the host, disenabling screen sharing and those kind of disenabling um, unmuting people um, or people unmuting themselves. So all of these things. And I think there's also the kind of more, you know, personal kind of aspect that Sophia mentioned as well of creating the, the boundaries of the discussion of making sure that people are aware that they should, you know, criticize arguments instead of criticizing the people making them. Um, I think those are very important things that we do try to go through when we have a conversation. And Kayla, if you're having issues with this, I think maybe breakout rooms might also be an issue. I'm not sure if that is an option for you, but that usually is very helpful to create kind of more meaningful conversations. Great. Um, so we do have, we are running low on time. We have about 15 minutes to go. So I'm just going to ask our panelists to keep our um, answers a little bit brief. I'm sorry to cut you off, um, but I do want to get in as many questions as we can. So Sophia, this next question is for you. Um, you have said that you're teaching um, particularly historical understandings of the conflict and trying to give students a basis in history for um, understanding the conflict today. Um, how do you manage the fact that there are competing histories, um, not only across um, the Palestinian narrative versus the Israeli narrative, but also within um, communities, that there are different kind of ideas of what history looks like? Yeah, so one thing that has been hugely helpful is we actually, I can get it. We use a textbook called Side by Side. Um, yeah, it's <laughs> probably people have heard of it. it. I can actually grab it one sec, but um it's basically um a book about the history of the region and every page has 
um, an Israeli text side and a Palestinian text side. So it allows you to go through the history um, of the region and go through each period of history, um, but getting both sides narratives. Um, so that's been a really helpful tool um, for starters. Um, and then I think we sort of in our lectures and in our presentations that me and my co-teacher give, we're always very um, intentional about the language that we use. Um, so we had a class a few weeks ago looking at just like language and how naming um, is politicized. So we try and be intentional with the language that we use. We always, um, whatever event we're talking about, we always sort of incorporate perspectives from both sides um, in our lectures. And then I think that's also the role of the guest speakers in our class is that we're able to bring in people, not just from one side or the other, but people from all sorts of different backgrounds um, to come and speak on their experiences and to show our students that to, you know, put faces to all of these histories. Um, so it's definitely a challenge, but I think this book helps a lot. The speakers help a lot. And ultimately a term that we try and keep in mind, which I learned from a book called The Holocaust and the Nakba, a New Grammar of Trauma and History. It's an amazing book <laughs> by an Israeli and one Israeli author, one Palestinian author. And they talk a lot about egalitarian binationalism um, as a framework for like approaching history. So that's definitely the, the our guiding approach is making sure that we're always telling a binational history. And then within that binational history, also incorporating the narratives and stories of groups that exist in the region and in the conflict that aren't part of that binational history. So just, it's just a lot of work on our end, honestly, to make sure that we're doing the research and incorporating all of the perspectives that are important to highlight in our class. All right, thank you, Sophia. Um, so our next question is, is there any sense that the two sides of this conflict need to be allies in the face of resurgent white Christian nationalism? So Yasmin and Stav, do you want to take a stab at that? Sorry, I'm just trying to think of an answer for that. <laughs> I mean, if Sophia, you want to answer also, that, that's also fine. No, that's just a really, I haven't even thought about <laughs> that before. So it's definitely, an interesting conversation. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> it's definitely an interesting question. I agree with you, Sophia. I think honestly, like there's so many nuances in the conflict and I feel like the Palestinians and Israelis like generally have like too much conflict and like too many, like, too many things to kind of think of rather than to just ally and go, you know, like, oh, how do I explain this? <laughs> I feel like there, there's too much like things between the, the two. And I don't think they would be, the reason for them coming together would be to go, be, like go against like Christian nationalism in that case. Like, I, I, I don't know. If anybody wants to chip in with that, that would be great. <laughs> I think, I mean, I think in a way some of my question is, oh, sorry. Reason. One reason I asked is my wife and I uh, were from New York, we're in New Jersey now, but we spent 12 years in Texas. And where we were in Texas, the synagogues and the masjids were definitely cooperating and on the same side because they were f seeing this kind of thing happening. There were armed white Christian nationalists who picketed a masjid on a Friday during services. And the following week, our rabbi led a group of us there to stand in front of the same masjid at the same time with flowers and welcoming signs. Mm -hmm. So we were definitely cooperating because we were facing the same kind of thing. Uh, I see your point now. I think what you're referring to is two religions coming together to kind of fight this Christian nationalism. 
the thing is when you're when we're talking about the conflict it's like palestinians who could be who could also be christian who could be jewish um like going against like israelis which is more of like a political thing so i think in terms of israelis and palestinians coming together to fight christian nationalism in that way i feel like it wouldn't be possible because it's more than just a religious thing like not all palestinians are muslim I mean, yeah, I think it's a lovely example, Morris, and I think it shows just the importance of interfaith and of kind of having solidarity in these situations of, you know, any kind of um, threat to religious minorities. But I think it might be a little bit um, separate, as Yasmin is saying, maybe from the reality in kind of Palestine, Israel. Sophia, do you have any thoughts on this one? It's all right if you don't. <laughs> Uh, I think I need to ponder that one, honestly, but I, I would love to think about that further because I think it's a really good question. Um, I think sort of, yeah, like Yasmin and Stav were saying, it's, there's already so much ground to cover in our class. And sometimes I'm like, I don't even know where bringing in, you know, this, another conflict into the mix, but I will definitely think on that. And I appreciate the question. <laughs> you put it so eloquently. That was exactly what I was trying to say at the beginning. <laughs> All right. Um, we have a question uh, briefly for Rory, actually. Um, so do you find that being neither Jewish nor Muslim nor Palestinian nor Israeli, um, do you find that helps you to navigate these conversations? Or does it mean that you kind of have less skin in the game or um, kind of less of a connection to people trust you more or less because of your um, your, your unique connection to it? Amazing question. Uh, yeah, so I think for me internally, uh, it made it easier in the sense of things being less emotive, uh, the ability to kind of be more objective, but also uh, you have that extra shield of being able to put yourself in these environments where you're going to hear things that you really don't want to hear. And that, you know, I think for, for Stav, Yasmin and, and for Sophia, there's probably been so many situations where they felt very uncomfortable or felt like their own identity has been denied. And I guess for me, I'm, I'm lucky that I don't have that as much. However, um, I mean, my committee, we the people who founded the society, we were a mixture of Jews, Christians and Muslims, which definitely gave the legitimacy, because if we were only one thing, people probably wouldn't trust the society and would see it as a fig leaf. So a fig leaf is the idea of kind of a fake olive branch. Um, it kind of masked it. Um, so that definitely helped us. Um, I think where what I kind of did connect with, however, is that I'm actually the grandson of um, someone who uh, was kind of involved in the Northern Irish conflict. And the Northern Irish conflict was definitely something that affected my family quite a lot and maybe is what led to my kind of interest and in feeling a connection with Israel Palestine. And, and I guess I experienced what I was talking about was to uh, an event in London called Exhibition, and there was a talk by someone from who was once in the IRA, uh, the Irish Republican Army, who were a terrorist Catholic group, and I actually felt really uncomfortable. And that was my first experience of kind of sitting in a room where I'm like, oh my God, like this person maybe would, you know, have advocated for the killing of my grandfather and something like that. And so I had that moment of, of kind of understanding it. But ultimately, um, I think on the one hand, um, there's difficulties because people could be like, you're Jew explaining me, you're Palestinian explaining me, you know what I mean? Like saying what our experiences are. So I always have. Um, sorry about that. I guess we lost him. Um... Uh, yeah, yeah, sorry, um, but, um, but that was pretty much my answer, so no worries. All right, <laughs> okay, um, thank you for that. And I don't think we have any more time for any more questions, unfortunately. I'm sorry to all those that didn't get their questions answered. Um, I wanna thank all the panelists for speaking today. Sophia, Stav, Yasmin, thank you so much. This was really informative, really helpful. Um, and thank you to everyone who came. 
Um, just a reminder to donate to Roots and to get involved with the Run for Reconciliation that Hanan mentioned in the beginning. Um, yeah, thanks so much. I, I also want to uh, thank our incredible interns and volunteers who I've been, I've had the pleasure of working with for the last uh, nine months or so. Um, and they put this whole, whole panel together. Uh, they worked super hard and I'm very proud and just well done. And they do so much behind the scenes work for Roots every day. So thank you. I'm really glad that everyone got to meet them. <laughs> thank you very, very much for having us. It was really, really lovely to meet all of you. And thank you for the questions as well. We really appreciate um, yeah, coming here and you're all very welcome to come to our events as well. I have put the links in the chat. I can put them in again and we do have lots of free events coming up and you're super welcome to come along. Yeah, thanks Roots for having me and thanks everyone for listening and hopefully it was interesting. Um, yeah. yeah Thank you, Ruth, for having us. I really enjoyed this panel. And thank you, everybody, who put such amazing and insightful questions and such supportive comments. Honestly, they made my day or my morning in this case. Um, but yeah, thank you. Hopefully, this is not the end of, end for, end of you know, your journey with exploring what the conflict is about and engaging in discussion. And yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Hanan, did you want to say something about the route, the run again, or? I could just mention again, uh, <laughs> look, at the, uh, look at the crowdfunding page for our run for reconciliation, March 14th. Israelis and Palestinians showcasing the Jordan Valley branch of routes, and we'll be having runners around the world run at the same time with us. For more information, see what I, what I put in the chat. Thanks everyone.